It's Thursday, November the 4th, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast exploring social, economic, political, and geopolitical concerns. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow. I'll be your moderator today, which means that live here from the Senior Commons on the grounds of the Hoover Institution, I'm in very close proximity to three wise men who we jokingly refer to as the Goodfellows. That would be the historian Neil Ferguson, the economist John Cochran, and the geostrategist slash hopeless optimist Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. And we're only 30 seconds of the show, and I'm going to correct myself. I said three wise men. Let's make it four. Our guest today is Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. He's a professor of health policy at Stanford University School of Medicine. Uh, alert Goodfellow uh, viewers. We remember we had Jay on the show in January to talk about COVID. Uh, COVID is still here, and we've once again asked Jay to come back and talk about health policy. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, great to be here. Okay, I'm looking around this panel here right now. I see a PhD. I see a PhD. I see a PhD. I see a PhD slash MD, correct? So how many of you thought about at one point getting an MD, going into science or medicine, some sort of scientific following? Well, I was supposed to because, of course, my father was a doctor and in Scotland it's considered a hereditary profession, but I couldn't stand the sight of blood. Uh, and it looked like, like far problem. it looked like far too much work. And so I opted out of medicine and became uh, a doctor of philosophy. Technically, I'm a, a D. Phil from Oxford. Phil. And, and in that sense, the black sheep of the family, because my mother was a physicist. My sister's a physicist. I don't know what went wrong, but here I am. John, do you ever regret not getting MD plates? Uh, MD, no. I mean, I started as a physics major. As far as I got towards an MD was one day of organic chemistry class, first year of MIT. I realized that I would I would fail this class by new new margins of failure and went right, right really back to loved. physics where I belonged. Yeah. I loved organic chemistry. You, <laughs> I, no, no, it's, it's, I hate it. It's just vast stuff with no organizing framework. Oh, it does. It's all, it's all, it, Anyway. That, that's why you are what you are, and I am not. <laughs> well, I was never adept at math, science, or engineering, even though at West Point, you know, they cram it down your throat. Like when I went, you couldn't major in anything. You got a bachelor's of science in engineering with a concentration in something else. And, and of course, they weren't too worried about offending you or, or your self-esteem. And so they would section you in, into sections based on your GPA in the course. So in calculus, I was in section 13 of 13 and then if you were in seat 16 in section 13 we called that the ejection seat but uh so i i knew i knew that, that you know pursuing an md was not in the cards for me for sure the writer was on the wall so jay let's uh let's kick off the show by talking about what's in the news today and that is president biden announcing that there will be a vaccine uh, mandate come january i believe if uh, correct me if i'm wrong here but i believe it applies to companies with 100 employees or more uh, the rule is you have your employees have to be vaccinated. If not, there have to be certain uh, exemptions. If they don't get a vaccine, they have to be tested every week. Uh, I think it applies to something like 84 million Americans, if I'm not mistaken. So we're talking about a lot of workers in America. Uh, a couple questions here, Jay. First of all, number one, is this warranted? But then secondly, how is OSHA, which is tasked with monitoring this, how is OSHA possibly going to monitor 84 million Americans? So there's a lot of opposition to this. I mean, yeah. I, 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 many... Uh, Attorney General from across state attorney generals have contacted me. They're already suing. Like they have the lawsuits in the books, trying right. to trying to uh, oppose this. Um, I mean, I, th I think uh, so to to get to your question of monitoring OSHA, the same way they monitor anything else, right? So that the OSHA has, uh, you know, uh, uh, OSHA has people they'll go like uh, check to see uh, that they rely mainly on the employers themselves and on employees complaining, I guess. So they had. They, I mean, I think it'd be hard to get out of this. It's, 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 not, it's not. It's not like you could. You know, uh, hundred percent company. Someone will complain, and then OSHA will kind of look and see. Okay, you're not enforcing it. So it's a real thing. I, I think, um, like the as far as like the actual policy itself, there's a few things that are, that are really curious. So the first is, uh, it has no exemption for people that have already had COVID and recovered. Mm -hmm. Right. Someone who's already had COVID and recovered is it actually have quite good uh, immunity against reinfection, probably better than if, if you get the vaccine. Um, and so it's kind of a strange thing to require someone who I mean, maybe doesn't want the vaccine for whatever reason, um, but they've, they've already had COVID recovered. A, a, lot of the, a lot of these companies have a lot of people like that in them. It's like, I mean, at least half the United States, I think, has had COVID and recovered at some point. Um, uh, so so there, there's that. Uh, the other thing is like we're, we're, we're the, the um, it's not actually strictly speaking a vaccine mandate, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can you can evade it by saying I well I, all right I'm not going to get the vaccine but I will uh, promise to mask up all the time, right? Not not for the vaccinated 
but don't, but uh, and and then I'll get tested weekly. Um, so, I mean, uh, the question is who's going to pay for it? For it? like, the, I think some companies will actually might even ask the workers to pay for it. I, mm -hmm. I'm not that, that's not clear yet. Uh, I think in California, them it, it'll have to be the companies that pay for it. But right. um, so uh, I, 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 it's one of these things where like it's it's uh, it's created an enormous firestorm. To, to make sure that a, uh, a segment of the population that's vaccinated gets vaccinated. Uh, it's not 84 million because a large fra fraction of them already have been vaccinated. So it's, it's um, but we're talking about people that are working age. The, the, to me, the, the, it seems like a misplaced policy priority. Like really what should be focused on is there's still 10%, 15% of elderly people not vaccinated in the United States. So, some, some, something on the road. They're the ones that are actually at high risk of mortality when the winter surge hits. Mm -hmm. um, there's almost no policy impetus on that direction, but it's on this sort of younger, relatively younger group that, that, that whether it's causing this like massive political firestorm. It seems like misplaced to me. So let me ask you to, to back up and, and help us and our, our viewers with this basic scientific question. This, you can tell this is designed to uh, keep people from giving it to somebody else. And that is, there's a justification for a mandate that if you are vaccinated, you won't give it to someone else, uh, then, you know, that's a reason we have for mandates. And, and the substitution of test and, test and mask for mandates suggests that the point is. So what do we know about how much a, um, the vaccine helps you stop giving it to someone else? Uh, how effective is mask and test on stopping giving it to someone else? Just help us out on the numbers right. here. Um, okay, so the, let's do the vaccines first. So there's, there's sort of two kinds of vaccine efficacy, right? So one is the vaccine protects you against getting really sick and going to the hospital and dying, right? So the, 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 the vaccines seem to be quite good at that. Like at six months, 90% efficacy for, for 85, 90% efficacy for all three vaccines. You're, I, I, I actually had the vaccine uh, in April, right? So, and, and, and um, the other kind of efficacy is against infection itself, right? Uh, it turns out that after four, five, six months, it declines very sharply. Like in, the, in a study in Qatar, it was like down to zero at five, five months, 0% efficacy. Uh, a study in Kaiser uh, uh, around here, 40% uh, efficacy at five months or six months, it's something like that. Uh, in, in other words, the uh, efficacy against all infections declines very sharply I'm over sorry, time. that means you get it, it kind of builds up a bit, but you fight it off before. Yeah, and so. that, that's what happened to me. So in August, I got COVID, um, I think at an airport. And then, um, I mean, it, I didn't go to the hospital, I felt miserable for a little while, but then it was better. Uh, and do you give it to other people while you're infectious as it's much possible. as? possible, yeah. Okay. So there was a study that was just published uh, in The Lancet which found that if uh, for people uh, who, uh, who have vaccines and then get a breakthrough infection, they pass it to people in their own home at roughly the same, just a little bit less, but roughly the same rates as someone who's not vaccinated and gets the infection. So it's, uh, it's you know, you, you can pass it on if you're vaccinated. It has some effect early, but it declines very sharply. I don't think the externality effect lasts for very long. I mean, this is the reason why they're pushing boosters, for instance. Um, is because you know this this protection against all infection declines very sharply over time. So, Jade, people watching the show right now, there are probably some people watching us thinking, why aren't these five people wearing masks? They're sitting within proximity of each other. Let's talk about masks and the the effectiveness of masks therein, because I think we're going to find within your own families, you're probably finding there are fundamental differences of opinions. You should wear a mask. You shouldn't wear a mask. If you do wear a mask, it should be an N95. No, just a mask does it. What is the deal with masks? Yeah, I mean, like you were, we're on we're on camera, so that yes. apparently COVID avoids people on camera. Is what I've learned from <laughs> watching the TV news. Um, no, I, I think uh, the, the 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 problem with the mask literature is that there's so, uh, so in the before COVID, there were a whole bunch of randomized studies on masks in community settings, in 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 uh, in, in hospitals, a whole bunch of places, randomized, like pretty good studies, uh, and they found nothing. Like the conclusion is that the mask didn't protect against respiratory diseases, like the viral respiratory diseases. Because right? they're just too small, right? The virus yeah. is too small. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, and they're, they're aerosolized, right? So even if, if it if it reduces droplet spread, it can the, the air goes out and it goes. It can you know you can still get you know it's like a, a, aerosolized means like a cloud. Droplets are like rain. The air, aerosolized viral particles can sit in the air for a while. So this is why, like, maybe we, what we should have done is invested. You know, very heavily in, in better ventilation in, in, or, or something like that. Instead of, and we spent six trillion dollars, we could have 
than well, a lot well, of I hope we're going to do the future soon. And, yeah, and it's, uh, better uh, ventilation for the future is a, a topic that would be to a good about. thing. Yeah. So, um, so, but I think uh, uh, th- I think that's partly why in February 2020, a, a large part of the public health people basically said, "Well, you know, don't 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 worry about the mask." Like the 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 coming into this, there was like not a lot of evidence. A lot of good evidence that did anything for respiratory viruses like this. Um, there was some evidence in hospital settings that masks work, especially if you're wearing those N95s and you know how to wear them really tight. I mean, any, any, I'm sure you all you've tried them on. They're really unpleasant. I mean, they're just not not. I don't, so I get that, like doctors in hospital settings were pretty well able to stop from getting COVID with a tight fitting right. N95. Yeah, I mean, there's many of them still got it anyways. But it's yeah, that's I mean, that's it does. It, it, there's some evidence that it has some protective effect, right? Given with the N95s. Um, the problem is, like, in uh, for most of the, the pandemic, there was no randomized evidence. And so there was a lot of, like, just fighting with this, with this work based on really poor evidence, I think. Um, there was a, there was a uh, finally, I think it was, like, September or October last year, there was a study by, in Denmark of, of uh, a randomized study of mass in Denmark where they had signed, like, 2,000 people on each side. One, one, it's, they, some, one group got the mask randomly, one group didn't get a mask. And they were like, you know, they couldn't force the people not to get a mask to not put a mask on or vice versa. But like what they found was that there was no difference in, no statistically significant difference in the probability of getting COVID, uh, the, the mask on mask group. I think the point estimates were like 2.1% of the masked, uh, unmasked group got COVID and 1.8% of the mass group got COVID. So it was like a 14% efficacy. I, want, I mean, I saw that study and I remember thinking, maybe this is the wrong way to frame the question. Given that we know certain things about COVID-19, the super spreader effect, the fact that it's very much an indoors virus. I mean, we see people peddling around the campus at Stanford with their masks on, and that does seem to me like a pretty futile thing to do. Well, and their helmets off. Put a the helmets mask off, on, helmet yeah. off, so they're... Right. So they have an access to and, and texting at the same time. Fantastic. So you're in the hospital, you're on the respirator with your brain injury, but you've got a mask we're, on. We're teaching, we're teaching our students how to assess risk very well. Right? <laughs> exactly. Sorry, go, go uh, but but if we recognize that the, the, the risk is uh, in an indoor crowded setting uh, with poor ventilation, what we really want to know is should you wear a mask in that situation? It's not really what's the what's the general population in all the general situations going to get from wearing a mask the answer to that is clearly not much mm-hmm. but i know that if i'm going into a crowded bar or a restaurant with the windows closed feels like the scientific evidence is is, is, is suggesting i should wear a mask there, Neil, like you, you you walk into the restaurant uh, wearing the mask, and then you sit down, and then immediately everyone takes the mask off. Sure. Well, that I, I mean, I th- I that think, makes uh, no sense at all. Right. Mm-hmm. Clearly. So that, at that point, we're in the realm of theater. Right. Right. Um, I, th- I think um, it, in certain settings, it makes some sense, right? So, like in a in a nursing home, uh, I, I mean, to me, it's like a matter of risk and like what the like. I don't think it does a, a huge amount, but it might do something. So there's a, this Bangladesh mask study where they found like a, I think it was like a, like a nine percent of efficacy of, of uh, surgical masks where, when like 40 percent of the villages uh, uh, masked up versus the control villages right so 11 percent was not a huge number it's not like 90 90 95 percent efficacy against severe disease from the vaccine I get that's that's what you compare it against so it's like it's it might do something um uh, but it, it has it, it, but it has to be like you say in a setting where it makes sense like I like so when the cost is really high of someone getting covid I think it's you try to do is everything you can. Like in nursing home settings, it absolutely made sense. Like in her hospital settings, it absolutely makes sense. In general settings, in schools where the ki- the kids, like you know, Sweden, all last year they're meeting in school full time, right? No social distancing, no masks, nothing. No kid dies from age one to fifteen, and no uh, and and the teachers they get COVID at rates lower than the general population. Yeah. I must say on this issue, I'm entirely with you. The the spectacle of, of my nine-year-old and four-year-old going to school every day and wearing masks in class all day depresses me. And I can't wait for that to stop. If getting at least the nine-year-old vaccinated gets the masks to go, then I think I'm all in for vaccination. But why, why tie them? 
Like just just get rid of the mask for the kids. Like I don't think this is second this is second best politician management. If the politicians I'm, won't let right. him take his mask off until he has a vaccine, we'll give him the bloody vaccine. So that was my segue <laughs> into the you know do we go with vaccinating kids? I I get that the risk to them is extremely low uh, from this particular virus, and I right. I've said many times in Goodfellas that we should all celebrate the fact that we got probably one of the first respiratory pandemics in history, not to go after the very young as much as the very no, I mean, young. I, when I saw the numbers on uh, the age distribution uh, out of China originally, I was I was like, I, actually, I was actively happy when yeah. I saw the, the Absolutely. kids. There were almost no kids. Yeah. In fact, and that's held up consistently it right has, the way through yeah. in every context. As, as, so as there's a really low risk. But I guess the question that, that I find myself having to address, because now there is a, an opportunity to vaccinate a nine-year-old in the Ferguson family, uh, <laughs> is is not, oh, am I going to protect him from COVID? But the issue I'm grappling with is, can we use this to get rid of the damn masks and some of the other restrictions? I don't, okay, so, okay, so this is a political economy question, not a medical question. So you guys are now <laughs> like absolutely blessed to come in. So just, um, for you will anyways, of course. Um, uh, uh, so the, the thing is, I don't trust the public health authorities in the places that are tying it together. I don't trust them to say, uh, okay, if we vaccinate kids, we'll get rid of the mess. I just don't believe it. Because what I think what will happen with the kids is what happened with adults. Right. Right. When it became clear that the vaccine, after a few months, does not stop the spread of the disease, and kids start getting the, start getting it, well, they already are getting it, right? They're, they're, but you, you, you look and say, okay, well, then they'll, well, let's, let's, we'll bring the mask back. I think that's what will actually happen. How can we, so well, this is really a question of, of public explanation. How can we convey to the public that the vaccine reduces very significantly, wonderfully well, your yeah. risk of serious illness, hospitalization, and death? It doesn't, prevent you getting COVID, but when you get COVID post-vaccination, it's going to be like getting the flu, and it is only a problem if you're really quite elderly or have a pre-existing condition. How can we get people to stop looking, in other words, at case numbers, which are no longer significant, and get them to look at hospitalization and death data, which are the only things at this point that really matter well, as far people, as I can see? You have to get, the problem is the politician, <laughs> where if one person gets COVID, and you, if you had relaxed the mask mandate and one person gets COVID, then instantly every day, oh, you were, you're, there's this infinite risk aversion bias. I remember there was the story of a, a teacher who apparently took his mask off for 10 seconds and somebody in the class got COVID. It's, ah, it's because he took his mask off for 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. well, Makes no sense there's whatsoever. another issue here, and this is institutional confidence. HR, I want to get your thoughts on this because you have had to stand at a White House podium and represent administrations mm. and speak in its essence for, for you know, an institution, believe in this. Uh, and this is going to segue into your good friend Dr. Fauci in the column you wrote this week. But I look at COVID HR and I see the problem is people who oppose the vaccination, maybe they oppose it because of religious beliefs, but they also oppose it because follow the far list. They don't trust big pharma. Yeah. They don't trust the government. They don't trust politicians. They don't trust Bill Gates. Fill in the blank whoever they don't trust. And so they do not want the vaccine. So. How do you sell this if the American people just do not believe in the institutions from which they're supposed to? No, this is a, this is a problem. We, we've had we've had shows on the you know the lack of credibility and in, in, in faith in institutions and the effect it's having on our society broadly. I, it, it is a big problem. It's, it's a big problem here in the United States. It's a bigger problem in places abroad. I mean, Russia is really get, is getting hammered by right. COVID now in large measure because nobody believes the government that uh, that they should get vaccinated and. And so I, I think, you know, how do you get over it? You have to restore confidence. And the only way to do that is through leadership and candor with the American people. And politicians, I think, who stop, you know, compromising our principles to score partisan political points. You and know? stop and, lying. I mean, and, people, uh, people don't trust the government because they know the government's been lying to them. Right. That's what goes on in Russia. You know, Russia says, yeah, the vaccine's safe. <laughs> says, well, I, you know, I heard the last hundred things you said to me. I know nothing's wrong. Yeah, so and let's, let's and, get and this it. This isn't yeah. a partisan criticism, we should point out. This happened right. to, uh, the last two administrations now. Have a, to put it mildly, inconsistent well, it's not messaging, really about, right, on, on, on COVID. It's not really about politicians. It's about bureaucrats. Well, so let's now get into our, your friend, Dr. Fauci. So you wrote about him this week for Newsweek. Uh, would you explain your column? He was on the Hill today, and he got into it yet again with Rand Paul. Rand Paul is determined to hang gain of function research around Anthony Fauci's neck, to which Fauci said the following. You have said that I am unwilling to take any responsibility for the current pandemic. I have no responsibility for the current pandemic. The current pandemic. To which you would say? Actually, I saw the exchange. So yeah. I, I, I'm tempted to take it out of context, but let me try to just put it in the context of what he actually meant, I think. Right. 
um, what I think he actually meant is that he, he did not fund the research that led to the creation of this virus that yes. has killed you know five million people around the world. Right. Which is, you know, I mean, I, I have no idea one way or the other. It's probably true. Um, uh, I mean, I, certainly he never would intentionally have done that. Right. So mm -hmm. that's that's absolutely true. So I think right. just to be fair to him, now let me take it a little out of context, because <laughs> uh, because I, I I'm really tempted to right. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, the the the. Uh, Dr. Fauci has played an absolutely central role in the, the pandemic response. And he, he has to take responsibility for the, both the successes and the failures of that pandemic response. Right? So like, let's count the successes. I, I can count them on one finger, the vaccine. Right? He was a very, very strong proponent of Operation Warp Speed and, uh, and, and used you know, the resources he had available to him at the NIID to help fund the research that uh, tested the vaccine. Um, so I think that is absolutely in his in in, in, the, in the credit camp. And that's a big finger. It's a we, big we finger. We should always remember that in a pandemic, the one thing to get right is a ve vaccine. He, but I think that the one point is, though, he was not the driving force right. behind pre-purchasing the vaccines, which was the most important decision in terms of how rapidly those vaccines that, that, could get out. That mm -hmm. was Trump. I mean, Trump, right. Trump yeah. made a, it was a bad, in fact, I was on a radio show la, uh, July of last year there were some radios was asking me, well, I just learned that they're buying all these like vaccines. We don't even have a vaccine yet. What, what's, what's going on here? Like, what is the scandal? And of course, exactly what you said. Trump made a bet that right. the vaccines were going to work. Right. And the pre-purchase probably saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Thousands if thousands only of lives. Biden had come into office and said, thank you, President Trump. You did one thing right. Let's all get vaccinated. Uh, and, and not turn this into a contrary yeah, we political. We could have. Think I, how many people would be alive now. I wrote a column in, in December of 2020, essentially, essentially suggesting that, like, let's we have all these vaccines, let's use them, let's roll them out all the old people, and then end the pandemic. Right. right? Yeah. That, we could have then held hands, said kumbaya. Biden uh, successfully rolled the vaccines out. He gets credit. Trump successfully made the bet that made that led to the vaccines. They he, they get credit, and we're all. I mean, this we're then we really are all in this together, right? So let's go back to Fauci because bungling. We, we want to hear more bungling stories. <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah. Well, let's get back to Fauci for a second because in your Newsweek column, you want you called him in to return to quote the basic principles of public health. Yeah. So, so I, I think I think that so I've, I want I've given credit. Let me, you gave him you, gave, give, you gave him a finger, not the finger, but a finger. A finger, no, a, a, a legitimately credit, right? So, mm -hmm. um, but then, but I think uh, on on almost every other aspect of the pandemic, I think he has failed of managing the pandemic. I think he has failed, right? So I think so. Just just to start with with HR with what you said about about telling the people the truth, right? So I'll, at the very beginning of the epidemic, he said masks don't work. I think, based on what I've already told you about what I thought the scientific guy was, that was actually the truth. Mm -hmm. But for him, he was saying that it was a noble lie in order to spare masks for people in working in hospitals. Couldn't you just said, don't. Hey, yeah, right. Right. Yeah. yeah, we really need it in the hospitals. That's where the COVID is likely to be. Yeah. Don't respond. But, Americans respond to that about as much as they respond to, well, only take one roll of toilet paper out of Costco. But the, the, but the problem is like, the, the problem is like, <laughs> oh, now I know what I need, really okay. need to go get. <laughs> I mean, I, you're, okay, but like the thing is like, you're, you're giving True. up your credibility for that, right? Right. right. Like once you've told the noble lie and it's exposed, or at least he thought it was a noble lie, or sa he says it's a noble lie, then it's that your credibility is shot. Right? And, and for, for, for public health, that credibility is, is absolutely vital. When, once it's shot, it's gone. Um, he uh, consistently through the pandemic has overemphasized the ability of lockdowns as a way to stop disease spread. He's, he spread panic in the population about the infection fatality rate, which is actually turns out to be you know, an order of magnitude lower than the case fatality rate, which he, he, he emphasized early in the pandemic. Um, he's, he uh, panicked parents over the risk to children from this, from this leading, I, th I think, to uh, the, 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 the long extended school closures we've had, um, which I think is the single worst mistake of the pandemic. Um, I, I, and, I, and I think over and over again, he has sort of provided this sort of illusion of control over, over this disease that we just actually don't have. And it's interesting because you're, what you're mentioning are not medical or scientific questions. Their social economic uh, questions, uh, you know, locking down a business. How many cases do you save by locking down a business? Uh, right. Well, that's not a question that I think there's a controlled clinical trial about. Can, no. we, can I ask a question about that specific point? Because it seems to me that we're not quite at the point at which we can do the full cost benefit analysis on 
what we broadly call lockdowns. But I have a sense that when we do it, and include some of the things you've written about, uh, the impacts on other conditions that were not being treated because of lockdown measures, my sense is that we're going to come out with a result that the public health benefits of the lockdowns, particularly the first very stringent lockdowns of, of 2020, will be minimal and probably outweighed by the, the costs, economic costs, but also public health costs. Is that what you sense we're going to end up finding? Or will the finding be, and here I, I, I'm going to bring in a, another friend of Goodfellas, Nicholas Christakis, will the other finding be, will the finding actually be that, that on balance there were benefits, they did slow the spread down and they did save lives? I don't think we've got the answer yet, but where do you think the answer will come down? I, I think Nick is wrong. I think, I think that the only question in my mind is whether the harms from the lockdown are two or three orders of magnitude worse than the, the lives saved by them, right. which I think are a first order answer would be zero. Like, I, I don't think that, um, well, let me put it this way. So like, what's the end state of this pandemic? The end state of this pandemic is endemic COVID, like mean, meaning COVID continues to spread in the population into perpetuity. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, get, we repeatedly are reinfected with it. Uh, and as and as, and actually that sounds scary, but it's not actually that scary because the, the the reinfection is is typically much milder than the first time you get it, much milder. Um, it, it becomes essentially a a a, a, a cold virus. But there's a counterfactual right? question here, isn't there? Because if one thinks back to last year, pre vaccines, there's a scenario in which surely we could have had, and here I'm really talking Nick Christakis is, but we could have had much higher levels of infection and therefore much higher levels of, of illness and, and, and mortality. We could have swamped hospitals in at least some parts of the country. I mean, the New York spike could have been repeated elsewhere. Don't you think it's possible that the lockdowns meaningfully slowed spread and averted mortality, or I, I are you really not persuaded? So. I'm really unpersuaded by that. I mean, I think... Uh, well, I, I think uh, to the extent lockdowns did anything, it protected a, a particular class of people. Right? I think it protected people who could keep their jobs without without any problem in their paychecks, right. and that's maybe thirty percent of jobs in the United States. Well, let me push out. I mean, China's lockdown worked uh, in the sense. Did it? Do I mean? Do we know that? I, I just don't. Do we know I, the numbers? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. The, I mean, I look. I look, I look at the rest of Asia, right? So, well, it's, it's, well, so we locked down business. We didn't. Lock, I mean, Europe locked down personal lives. We and China down, locked down life China, I mean, China in a way that nobody else could do. I mean, if 10% I mean, of people were that. dying, yeah. okay, so, so uh, it's a different question. I, 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 yes, right. So if it was the 10% IFR disease, we, I, mean, I think maybe, well, it would depend on the spread, right? So, so uh, I, I think the right answer to this question has to do with how widespread was it when we first realized. So like we, we, we basically locked down it in the, at the middle of, Mar- of March, right? Um, by April of 2020, there was 40 times more infections than cases in LA County. That's what we found in the seroprevalence study, 50 times up here. And, and you know, it's not just my seroprevalence studies, there's a whole sequence of them that were done right around then, yeah. finding the same kind of multiple all over. The, we, we were not finding very many infections. It was already, it was like two or 3% of the population. In New York, it was probably like four, five, 6% of the population. Um, and uh, it was already too late, right? Th- at that point, it's so widespread that you cannot hope to stop it to go to zero. Um, Australia and New Zealand provide a really good example of what of, of this, what I'm, what I'm talking about. So in Australia and New Zealand, it hit in the in their summertime, and they have like you know one or two international uh, airports. They closed them down. They actually closed the borders. Their prevalence was probably they didn't do a zero prevalence. I don't know for sure, but it's probably quite low. And so they stopped the disease from spreading to zero. They got it down to zero for extended periods of time, and yet it came back. Right, uh, they're, and they're, they're, I think they both finally had given up on the zero COVID goal. But they've been able to do that with vaccines, which they couldn't have developed in 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 the in country because there weren't enough cases sure. to test them. Oh, yeah, yeah right. we're never going to get vaccines from those countries. Yes, but right. From a selfish perspective, you could say that that approach—it's like least, a beggar thy neighbor epidemiological policy. Well, well certainly, we, so, yeah. But when you, if one just asks, you know, how many people died per million. Right. It is. It's, it's a tiny number in New Zealand and Australia compared with right because they, the they, they 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 relied on the on the on the on the vaccines being developed yeah. elsewhere, right? right. So, right. but I think that that the point is that their end game, if you go out to end end it, is infinity is the same as ours, right? Everybody gets COVID. Now they're lucky because they get the vaccines on board before before the a whole bunch of people get COVID. 
right? So that, but I think that's the only case you can make for the lockdown, right? So we delay the the onset of the of the of, of when you get COVID until a vaccine arrives. Yeah. But that was a bet, right? So, uh, but I think it only protected a certain class of people. It did not. So I'll give you a, 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 a basic statistic. You can go look up in LA County. Um, in LA County, uh, the neighborhoods with African with with Hispanics have three times the COVID mortality through the pandemic than whites. That's in if you go look in Florida, it's equal whites and and, Hispan- and Hispanics in terms of the mortality. Same thing for blacks and Hispanics and, and whites in, in Florida. Uh, Florida, which had a much more open policy, actually had the age-adjusted mortality that's the same as California, almost identical. Like, but are, there other, are there other factors there too, like weather, for example, and then and then Social where people cultural. live? You know, people, you know, obviously in New York City live on top of each other. And the related question is, wasn't it necessary to put some form of a, of a lockdown or or you know, or really controls on people getting together, you know, in in large venues, to to really reduce the burden on the healthcare system. I'm thinking especially of New York, and then you remember as the as the wave moved across the country, certainly Los Angeles, uh, and then and then you know New Orleans and so forth, especially places where they had really you know uh, under uh, under resourced public uh, healthcare systems that were just getting hammered in those early days. Yeah, I mean, I think I think like from, we we locked down all, all, nationwide. And yeah. you know we had a in Santa Clara County we we used the Santa Clara County Convention Center to for an ex, like an overflow hospital, yeah. not one bed was used. Yeah, as right, far as I know, right. right. So like I mean, well, it was the same Washington State as well, yeah. uh, but but it wasn't that wasn't true in, in in New York, but actually the Javits Center as you know wasn't used that extensively. Definitely, yeah. What what was necessary was to reinforce existing hospitals with some military personnel and so forth to to unburden the doctors and the nurses yeah. who are getting overwhelmed. So, so our discussion, as well as the current policy discussion, seems to have taken a big step back relative to the sophistication. I remember us talking about this a, a, a year and a half ago. Um, we, you know, there was the bungling of the CDC, which did not allow us tests. So there is a public policy response that involves widespread testing, asymptomatic testing, pooled testing, so you know where it's hot and where it's not, that recognizes super spreader. We, we just... You know, we're, we're into mask mandates and no mask mandates, but how about, you know, close down the bars, but not the auto potty paint shop where people, you know, work on a respirator anyway. Um, there's a, a sophistication to activities that you lock down where super spreaders are likely in places where you know that it's high. That There was a vision, at least, that maybe next time around we could have a, a sophisticated response. The next time came a year later. And all, all we can talk about is we're not doing lockdowns because obviously that, that was a disaster, public health. We t- finely tuned mask mandates. You know, today pull it up to your chin, tomorrow pull it up to your nose, basically kind of mask mandate. It's the only thing we're talking about. But this great sophisticated public health response that could have happened it was I, unbelievable bungling that didn't I mean, happen. And we're not, we're not even, we had the I, chance to do it a John, second time. I don't think we, we had, I, I, I think a lot of that was an illusion of, of knowledge that we didn't actually have. Like we don't actually have, a, the, but we could have it of, next time. We could have had it we now. Could it? I mean, could we? I mean, I, th- I think the problem is this: is like um, you, you lock down uh, a certain class of people can can comply. The rest of society cannot, right? And so we have this like idea of like no, let's stop you, these you part- these, these activities. Events. Well, how do you know where they are? Like that's, that's well, that's what science helps us with. But what was clear, what was not clear in March 2020, and was clear in June 2020 is that you know, crowded bars are bad, auto body paint shops are perhaps like most okay, of the, Stanford doesn't have most to turn of the, off the credit card machines to the parking lots in order to brush stop COVID, which are still not okay, working. So, okay, but, but <laughs> most, most, of, most of the transmission happened in hospitals and it has been, it happened in homes, and it happened in the workplaces that were left open. Those were the, th- those were the three primary locations of spread in all of these like, contact tracing studies. How do you lock those down? Right? I, th- I think we just don't actually have a technology to stop this virus from spreading. And I think that's been the central problem. No, you, you just got to get the reproduction rate under one. You don't have to stop it Forever? from spreading. I mean, the problem is like it... Uh, well, for a while. Until yeah. Until, until, until until so let me, let me ask, answer HR's question, because I think that's probably the, 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 the crux of it. Right? The, the crux is, uh, is there some disaster that will happen if, if, the, if the disease spreads? Because the disease, uh, just let me just be blunt, I think everyone on earth is going to face COVID. Right, and I was, I was talking about pre-vaccine days. Correct, right. right. So right. exactly, that's why I think I think it's yeah. a really good question. But when so, you're trying to stop a, a catastrophic exponential spread, yeah. So like, so, so like you look at, I think the, the the critical thing is Italy, right? We looked at Italy, yeah. right. and their healthcare system got utterly overwhelmed. Right. 
right? Um, it was sad. It was, it was, I mean, it was yeah. devastating. It was sad, right? I mean, and uh, I think there's still, you can still see it in the Italian response, it, it's sort of more extreme than much of the rest of Europe as a result, uh, still. Um, so so I, I think um, we have to like do an honest assessment of what, because it's not like possible to get rid of the disease. It's going to stress hospital systems. It right. just is. It, there's, no, there's no way around that fact. You have a, a pandemic like this to pretend like we can get to zero forever is not going to happen. Like we're not we're not an island in the, in the in the Pacific, right? That's going to be able to do that. Right. So we have to then we have to like say, okay, how can we expand capacity? The, the lockdowns actually reduced capacity, right? It kept. I just was reading the paper in the NBER today about it, how it reduced female labor force supply because you mm-hmm. stay, they stayed home to t- right. women stayed home to take care of kids. Um, a lot of nurses stopped working, like the sh- the shortages in hospitals. Caused by the lockdowns, kids stayed home from school and went out to play with their friends. So let me Gee, ask, that's where, let, let's ask a forward-looking question. question. Uh, let's imagine that you're Fauci next time, and another comparable but novel pathogen comes along. What's the right response this this time around, based on the lessons that that you've learned? I mean, I I think we should follow the same plan that we follow for a hundred years of of these of, of epidemics. And it's worked, it's worked, I mean, it's never going to be perfect because it's, a, it's an epidemic, we'd rather they didn't happen, but like they've worked much better than what we did. And, the, and the, resp- the, the, the principles are simple. Identify the vulnerable, move heaven and earth to protect them, and then uh, disrupt the rest of society as little as possible. The rest of society should go on because the harms from disruption of society are so catastrophic that it, you're, it, you're, uh, that and it very often it results in the kind of panic that results in bad decision making. Um, that you wouldn't do that, right? So uh, all every other pandemic for the last hundred years, that's what we did. Um, that's that I think that's what we should have done this time. Wait, but that is the what 1957 if, if playbook, isn't it? Yes. What if it's smallpox? What if it's cholera? I mean, we got this. I view this as the fire drill. Because this really the death. Well, rate cholera, is this is focus protection, right? So you go find the Broad Street <laughs> pump, uh, you 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 shut it down, and then let the rest of society go. I mean, I think that you have to like it depends on the the nature of the disease. Yeah, but but and here, the here you're, you have a vision here where it we get the reproduction rate below one, and not everybody gets cholera because thirty percent of the people who do die. And, yeah. And the bubonic uh, plague, fifty percent of the people who get it die. So we're, we're okay. So here we're 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 at a, a thing where we are trying to. Not eradicate it, but but really contain it so it does not spread through the population. And, yeah, uh, I mean, I think right, so. You're making a judgment that this one, well, you know, so if you enough so people like, die, we can let everyone no, get no. it. No, I mean, I think it's not a question of let; it's a question we don't have a choice, right? It's not a disease where we have a technology to stop the spread of the disease. But this is very much the right? 1957 well, Eisenhower government's decision. We can't stop right. the spreading. The main thing is to keep the show on the road, and they don't have any. Significant economic impact. 1976, 19, uh, it's every single pandemic, yeah. uh, even to 2009. But one thing I've learned over the past year, because when I was writing uh, my book Doom, I was thinking a lot about 1957. This is worse than 1957. That's clear. Yes. The global death toll is definitely coming in significantly well, I mean, above 1957. We don't know. We didn't have the testing. We, there was no PCR in 1957. We don't. I mean, there's like data issues that, like, you know, it's hard to, it hard to know. It feels exactly. like it's overtaken 1957 in terms I, I mean, of I, the death toll, even if you accept the Johns Hopkins number. If you buy the economists' numbers, and I don't know what you think about those, but when, when we're talking 15 million rather than 5 million, it feels like we're, we're, we definitely were confronted with something that was worse than 57, but not as bad as 1918. So it sort okay, of feels so, like. But that's where it is historically. I, I think I think the uh, I think the key thing is not the actual death rate, right? Is it? It's it's a bad disease, absolutely. The key thing is not even the the app the, the the median IFR. The key thing is the age gradient yeah. in the IFR. That's the central most important fact about this Agreed. about this disease, Agreed. right? Because it then provides you a, a way to identify who's vulnerable and then think creatively about how to protect them. Like imagine if we'd done that instead of saying ventilators were the thing that's short supply, hospital beds. Well, then we wouldn't have sent oh god yes. infected yeah. patients back to nursing homes because why we were trying to conserve is hospital beds. Like we were conserving the wrong thing because we didn't learn the yeah. lesson from the Chinese and, and, and Italian experience from it. Right. Um, and there was some adaptation, right? Because remember, the Javits Center initially was going to be for non-COVID patients, and they said, okay, well that's not going to work. It has to be for COVID patients, but they can't be the ones who, who are who are the most ill, so it was for the recovering patients to go there. So it seemed like we learned on the fly. Do you, 
Do you have yeah, a sense I mean, that we that we're institutionalizing any of those any of those lessons? I mean, I'm just thinking about how the lack of authoritative and transferable data on you know on hospital beds, ICU units, and ventilators at the beginning, which then that turned out not to be the best therapy. So, what do you think we've learned, Jay? And do, are we? Uh, do you see any evidence that we're trying to ensure that the next time? That there, we can make better decisions, get better guidance. I, I'm, what I'm afraid is that, like the people that made the wrong decisions, have a very strong vested interest to protect themselves against the the, the, the judgment, which is that that, that they that they made errors. Right. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic. Like in the early days of the epidemic, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? So, how do you deal with that uncertainty? Like people use this thing, this 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 uh, this this uh, um, precautionary principle, right? Assume right. the worst about the disease, and then design a response around that. The problem is like the, the thing that you do, you can't assume the best of it. Like the lockdowns, you can't say, okay, there's going to have no costs, which is essentially what it's, it's like a weird asymmetric application of the, of the precautionary principle. I think that, and, and um, I, I think a lot of the lessons that were, that I think the people that were in charge of it, Fauci, for instance, uh, are going to, they're going to try to say is that, well, we didn't do what we did hard enough. Right. Yeah. Right, we didn't we didn't become China where we literally locked everybody in the house. I I, I think that yeah. that would have been absolutely catastrophic in the United States. But Jay, does common sense have to die in that scenario? If you go over to the Quad in the Stanford Building, there's a file with my name on it, and it's a series of crank letters that I write to the university. One of which, and Neil can relate to this, was about the Stanford swimming pool, which shut down when this whole thing hit. And I wrote a very measured letter saying, I don't understand why the pool is closed. As far as we know, this is not carried by water. And if you just let people in an orderly fashion, not through the gym, but just go straight to the pool and swim in separate lanes, that strikes me as social distancing. Why is the pool not open? And about six months later, I think they open up doing exactly that. But you see time and again, we're just erring on the side of caution. And John mentioned this with parking meters at Stanford. You just do actions which just fail the test of common sense. So getting this idea of you are the next Fauci, if you will, how can you move forward with combating a pandemic at the same time respecting that some things just are nonsensical? I mean, I think I think a lot of the reasons why we had those nonsensical policies is because of the panic, and that panic itself was part of a policy. Right. Right. We when you when you are uh, when you are acting out of this panic, you are going to latch on to anything you can find, even if it doesn't make any sense at all. Like they put one like the on park benches, they put the number one. So only one person could sit on a huge park bench. Uh, like what? What purpose was that? Right. Like I think this is one of the most fascinating decision. things about the history yes. of the pandemic. Yes. That it empowered uh, bureaucrats with zero public health knowledge to right. make up crazy rules, and it was as if they they got creative. My my favorite example, which has already been alluded to, was the buffer lane at yes. the at one of the Stanford pools because you had to have a lane to stop those viruses swimming <laughs> you, laterally. You, um, you have a four year old that you, that you go to a playground where they like put. Yellow tape yes, around the around the, the no, no, around the fled, swings. Remember, the answer to this problem was to flee California to oh, a state that was run that was on the same <laughs> basis. And we went to Montana when none of this happened. Right. And it is worth remembering that lockdowns were quite a coastal phenomenon. Well, yeah. it's in the heartland. They they did not happen. Right. And of course, uh, there was then a great surge of infections when the weather got cold in late 2020. But up until that point, it was actually a remarkably unlocked down experience. But for me, the interesting thing that you've highlighted is that those people who believed in lockdowns as an end in themselves, as a sort of exercise of bureaucratic control, are very, very keen to have their decisions validated. So that, going back to John's point, the next time we will be hit by probably even more regulations and even more dysfunctional or pointless, or even downright harmful right. regulations. So it feels to me as if there's a battle to be fought about the history of 2020, the pre-vaccine history of COVID. And that battle is very important because if the wrong side wins, then the regulatory state is going to claim victory and its argument will be, the only thing we did wrong was we did not lock down enough Pardon. and there weren't enough buffer lanes and the parks were not sufficiently <laughs> closed. Well, I mean, I, th I, think, I think here the, um, uh, the object lesson is New Zealand and uh, Australia. Yeah. Right, they, 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 if you, if you're going to say what, what the success looks like, well, that they are successes in that sense, right? They lock down hard, hard enough so that they could get to ro more or less normal. I think, of course, expats couldn't come home. Uh, uh, parents are dying in Australia, and their their kids can't come visit them. You can't cross 
you know, from New South Wales across, you know, to, to any, anywhere outside or whatever. That's all. It's all fine. It's all good because they kept COVID to zero until until not. But then they vaccinated the population, um, and that now they're fine, right? Mm -hmm. But was that a success? Like, it's not. It's not a first. It's not a replicable success, right? It's not something that could you could you could bring to the United States and say, okay, we're going to shut down every single international airport. We're going to shut down every, all, all our borders. We're going to. We're gonna, it's going to be. You know, I can't cross from. Yeah, from I can't go visit my mom in LA, right? We, is that ever going to happen in the U? I just don't think that that's compatible with 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 America. Well, a lot right? of what they did was also pointless. I mean, there's no point in shutting down travel if the person on the plane is equally or less likely to have COVID as the person next door. So it's just a, it's just a complete waste. I mean, they they shut down all sorts of things that are like the parks and so forth. But the best case, they're now going through their COVID wave, vaccinated. Yeah. Right. So that's that's well, that's if, that's if the, the success. If the metric right? is deaths per million, they clearly win. The question I think you're rightly asking is: Was this an option for the United States, or for that matter, for the United Kingdom? Because there's this enormous variance in the English-speaking world that that is quite interesting. It suggests that we're not all the same, even if we speak the same language. I'm amazed at what Australians and New Zealanders put up with. Uh, I began to wonder if this tells us something about the origins of Australia. Uh, that you're thinking it's still, still a prison colony. Penal colony. I've had, I've had, I've had, I've had, <laughs> I, I, and that's with apologies to our Australian viewers. I couldn't resist it. I, okay, I, I, okay, I got. I actually got a serious point on this. So I think part of this is um, the strength of HR's argument about the healthcare system, right? So in Australia, New Zealand, protecting the healthcare system it was an extremely important political priority. Like far above what I think Americans generally like, even in the UK, like save our NHS, right? So um, uh, that that uh, itself led to a desire for a, to do something to to so that 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 they, that they don't get overwhelmed. Ironically, they're overwhelmed. Like I just read a story today that in Australia, there's the the the, the Australian healthcare system is overwhelmed, right? Uh, with non-COVID things. Right? So, so the, the 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 problem is like these. We, 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 if you redesign your society around the, uh, the, the control of one infectious disease, you are going to let go of every other health priority, which is essentially what we've done. Right? And, and actually, like, I, let's broaden it outside of the West. Uh, the effect of the lockdown on, on the developing world is absolutely catastrophic. 100 million people thrown into poverty, 80 million people with food insecurity, uh, you know, like star starvation. Checks, yeah. no, they, I mean, hundreds of thousands of children dying of starvation. Um, you know, tuberculosis, rate, death rates higher, uh, enormous numbers of children missing their regular childhood vaccinations. I mean, it's just absolutely catastrophic. Um, you know, we, and part of it is like, we, we, you know, we spent the last 30 years with, or longer with globalization. We made promises to these poor countries about trade relationships, and they disrupted their, 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 their economies um, uh, they, they like changed their economies based on these promises in order to fit into the globalized economy, and then overnight we broke those promises, and so it's not surprising you're seeing this like a huge uh, d disaster happening in the developing world. I mean that's something that should have entered our moral calculus but didn't. So I want to push you on, on that. We need to write the history. You're exactly right. We need to write the history so that we don't do the same mistakes. The the strand of that I've been reading has a lot of FDA and CDC bungling in it. The CDC forbidding Stanford from using its own tests. The FDA only, I think, like a week ago, finally are we allowed to use rapid paper strip tests. So there certainly is a view that you can reduce the reproduction rate by widespread cheap testing. And we were forbidden to have it. Um, Three-stage clinical trial, and then the FDA delays it another week and a half so they can look like, let's talk about managing psychology, look like they're taking it more seriously. So it's, I mean, uh, you know, everything is either forbidden or mandatory. Uh, if we had been, if you've been allowed to try it on an experimental basis, think how many people could have. We invented this vaccine overnight. And going forward, why do we not have a vaccine for the Delta variant? Are we really going to have to have a full year of three-stage clinical trials for every single variant that comes along? Which means it sort of comes, it peaks, it dies on its own, and then we're finally allowed to use the vaccine against it. Uh, there is a story of institutional, not leadership, not big political decisions, but institutional bungling that, that uh, and, and infinite risk aversion here yeah. that I think really made it much worse than it needed to be and that needs to be fixed for the next time around. I, I, I 
I completely agree. I think both okay. the CDC and the <laughs> FDA, <laughs> uh, especially the CDC, I think has failed. Um, but the, the, and the FDA, I, I mean, I've I mean, just the reason the boosters. Yeah. Where we're sitting around for weeks and weeks and weeks saying, okay, boosters, well, the scientist, you know, we're a 63-year-old with asthma can get it, but we don't want a 64-year-old. I, I, I guess I'm a little, like, the thing is, like, I, I'm, I, uh, you know, I, I have an MD, so, like, I, I have this, like, bias toward if I don't have, like, randomized data, I don't want to give the treatment. I can understand the FDA a lot more than I can understand the CDC. Like, the FDA has an institutional sort of bent toward asking for this kind of data. And I understand the argument, the economic argument to say, okay, that's too, it's, there's type one and type two error and you're letting too much type well, two error. But in, there's but. also, there, there's, when you are in a pandemic, if you're in a pandemic where 10% are dying, yeah. we do not have the time for three stage clinical trials. You want, is it safe? Once you know it's safe, but, boom, I, out so it goes. I, what I'd say is like, um, if I'm gonna criticize the FDA, um, actually, it's, I think it's just broader than the scientific establishment. We put a lot of effort in the vaccines. We put a, just a fraction of that effort into early treatment, an assessment of early treatment, especially like uh, like the, the, those cheap drugs. I mean, I still don't know just if these they early work. Early treatment, long COVID. Those are the big issues. Yeah, but why on earth did we not put a, like the same kind of effort that we put into the vaccine we should have also done with, with early treatment? Right. And so none of the therapies were getting are getting approved except for the you know the really big pharmaceutical companies. Right. And right. Why is that? I mean, because well, of course, a, if, if it's an if it's a you know if it's epidemic, right, and it's going to be with us you know uh, forever. Uh, you think the therapies would be well? So this priority? is this actually I put on Fauci's actually it, because he sits on this massive pile of money, the NIAID, and his. Uh, so I can understand why a pharmaceutical company want to push their drugs through, and they have a very strong economic interest, and they've been successful in like there's, there's just that Merck drug that just got got approved in the UK, for instance, right? Yeah. Um, I think that's I'm, and I meant to say endemic. It's, it's all. It's all. I mean, so I think that's that's all fine and good, uh, but you have like drugs that are not on patent that have, nobody has an interest in in testing or or checking. It's, it's a market failure that is solved by having an NIAID in the first place. And we did spend five trillion dollars on this, so you know, some some money for that sort of thing. We could have. We could have easily done. We could have like organized large trials. And, and so, like I st like people ask me, does ivermectin work? I still don't know the answer. Why do I not know the? answer? There's like all these like little trials that are done all, all over the world. They come to like some some like look, make them look like a miracle drug, and some make it look like it's useless. Why do I not have that answer? This is something the NIAID was supposed was had the, the resources and should have organized in that, a lar large scale trials. They have one I think is like Active Six that's due to be done in twenty twenty three or something. It's like what, you know, like what? Where was the the same kind of 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 like this is a crisis? Let's work quickly to get this thing with the vaccine. We should have done with the early treatments as well. Can I ask a question about academia? We've talked about the public health bureaucracy and. I think that's a huge part of the story, but I'm interested to get your perspectives on the academic world because it seems to me that there was there was a good story to be told. I was amazed at the kind of research that was done very rapidly in multiple disciplines in institutions all around the world. And if you could bear to drink from the fire hose last year, you could learn an awful lot about COVID very fast. But there's also, it seems to me, an interesting problem of groupthink and a tendency in certain quarters to start insisting that there is a settled science before there possibly can be. <laughs> right. uh, and then to start policing uh, people in the field. Uh, and I wondered if you could tell us a bit about your experience with uh, colleagues in in parts of, of, of this institution, Stanford, who I, I've been struck by their rush to establish orthodoxy is rather early in in the scientific game. What's going on there? It seems unhealthy. Yeah, it is unhealthy. I think it, it's uh, uh, like people look on the outside and they say, okay, well, there were a few people at Stanford who who, who dissented, right? They'll say like John, John, Yanides, me, a few others, right? And say, okay, Stanford's healthy because it has this to be. I, I'll tell you, it's re it's been very difficult to, uh, and um, I think that Stanford at has not actually come through as well as it should have in its commitment to academic freedom. Um, and you're absolutely right about this, this sort of like jumping on um, an orthodoxy that long before the orthodoxy could possibly have, have, have I think I saw this in your book. I, so so there, there, there's like really just two norms, right? Like one norm in public health, 
where you, there kind of has to be an orthodoxy, right? where because there has to be consistent messaging. You don't want to like tell people confusing things, right? So if I tell people that smoking is good for you, I've committed a sin, right? It's not because it's not good for you. There's a ton of evidence, well established. It's not clear that nicotine is bad for you, but that's another well, place just, where like, we're I, having I, exactly no, this there's, problem. There's ahead, no right. subtlety. I just smoking is bad smoking. for you, John. Very no, 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 no. Nicotine patch. It's not obvious that that's bad for you because we're not allowed to do research. on Okay, but see now that's the thing. Okay, so but yeah. now. Uh, we have a thing where there actually is scientific, not scientific consensus. There's not time for scientific. This is a new disease. We don't know. You know, we don't. We do, do we know what lockdown? This lockdown or that lockdown solves it. We, do we know? Do we know uh, closing schools is worthwhile? Do we know masks are worthwhile for this? Do we know all these things are active areas of research and, and uncertainty, and yet we. It was like the the orthodoxy closed in on itself, imposed the public health norm on a scientific debate that needed to be freewheeling. Right. So what was going? What was driving that? I was trying to figure this out because, you know, someone who doesn't come from the world of sciences, I don't properly understand how these norms get set. But my recollection from my Cambridge days was that in those days, scientists positively loved uh, to disagree, uh, sometimes publicly, but there wasn't a kind of sense that you had to all agree uh, and, and then call it the science and then start to call out colleagues who didn't subscribe yeah. to the science. Because this feels less and less like science and more and more like uh, religion in the heyday of the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> well, I don't want to ask that. Right? You were criticized not just for some sort of scientific orthodoxy, but for disagreeing with the official pronouncements of the County of Santa Clara and, the right. and Stanford University. Yeah. So now not only are we not allowed to, whatever is popular in the faculty lounge, but you're not allowed to disagree with authority? <laughs> it's, you know, so I think, honestly, I mean, I, it's, it's like it's, a bizarre. It's, it, it reminded me of like Lysenko, uh, who's like, like the geneticist yeah. in the Soviet Union, right? He's he's like he's convinced that uh, the Darwinian evolution isn't the thing. It's it's really it's like the experience of plants passes on to the next generation, and, and he's Stalin's favorite scientist. And so all of the other scientists, who, the Darwinian evolutionists, get sent to the gulag or something, right? Um, I mean, it's it's it, it's it, I mean, that, that, that's being like probably over dramatic. It's being over dramatic, but it's felt like that a little bit. But let me just, let me ask the, the question: In the course of your career, has there been a change? Because it feels to me as if academic life generally has moved away from this is a place for free inquiry. We'll disagree. We'll we'll debate. We'll see where things uh, fall out, and we've moved to. Uh, something that feels almost like uh, the the clergy in the pre-Reformation church. There is orthodoxy and we're here to impose it. And woe betide the academic who dissents from uh, the orthodoxy. I mean, has that is that true? It's certainly true in my field. Is it true in your field too? It, it, I didn't, it never felt like that before the pandemic. I mean, I, I, I worked on, I mean, you do health policy, you're going to work on co controversial things. I've worked on controversial things and I mean, you know, I've had disagreements. I've never had this kind of environment where basically people are just trying to censor me, silence me, make sure I go away. Right. So I think that there was a feeling we need to get on board to get people to wear their masks and take their vaccines right. because the dumb peons aren't doing it. But you also so walked... I think that's the, if there is a charitable motivation for it, right. that's it. But you also walked into an issue, an issue in the middle of an election year, very contentious election year yeah. as well. So it's always an election year in the U.S. <laughs> As we saw this yeah. week. So, guys, the clock I mean, is telling me that we're going to have to wrap up here. So, Jay, well, actually, Jay, Jay, we'll one, one, point? one quick point before about, about, about science. So, if Absolutely. that if that continues, if that kind of environment continues, the public support for science will collapse. Mm -hmm. Right? Science depends on public support. This funding for science, a large parts of it is is tax money, and uh, science it has this like exalted status in the public because it, is, it has had this like a, this process that tends to find the truth. If, if this kind of scientific environment continues into the future and we don't actively work to reform it, I think that, that the, the, the public support for science will collapse. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot is at stake in that. Okay, so final question, that's all excellent. I want everybody to take a shot at this. We last saw you nine months ago. So I think we agree we have to get a Dr. J booster more than once every nine months because we <laughs> clearly ran out of time here. But let's have you back here before nine months. The next time we see you, what do you think we're talking about with regard to COVID? Are we talking about this ongoing struggle to get the last 15% of people vaccinated. I think actually 60% of the population right now said a vaccine. So are we talking about the Duggan population won't do this? Are we talking about mandates? Are we talking about the effect on, on businesses? Are we talking about some sort of grassroots pushback against this? Because we saw on Tuesday night, a lot of discontent voters take out their frustrations on taxes and education across the country. Or are we talking about good news? What do you think, Jay? I mean, I think COVID will end uh, sooner, so sooner rather than later. I don't, I don't, I think, 
the you know the winter may be rough i don't know but like but i don't i don't think we'll have a next winter if we if we meet a year from now we won't be talking about this this sort of issue mm -hmm. it'll be more of a retrospective thing what's happened to the universities what's happened to the the federal regulatory agencies that oversee science what's happened to science what's what what's the postmortem for the next pandemic plan i think that's the thing that we're we're likely to be talking about mm -hmm. hr well i i hope we're talking about how you know, we expected as we came into this pandemic that it would bring Americans together and it didn't. And I hope we're talking about all the efforts all of us are, are making to reverse the polarization that we've seen in our society over so many issues and recognize that, you know, we have more in common than we have differences in terms of what we want for our children and our grandchildren and begin to talk more about, you know, hey, what do we gr agree on first before we get into disagreements? Because I think there's a lot we can get done in healthcare, in other fields, just by acting on what we can agree on. And, and and what we see today, you know, on everything from, you know, from from climate, you know, and the neglect of energy security as a part of that, is are, are these non solutions that are based in ideologies and are based in partisanship, right? So, you know, I maybe I'll try to be optimistic and say we're going to be talking about how <laughs> how uh, how we how we Kelsey bottomed Prince. out, we bottomed out, right? And no kumbaya, yeah, things are getting better. I I like that. <laughs> <laughs> John, you looked into the future. What does the future hold? What are we talking about the next time we bring this? Um, I hope we are talking about what's brewing in what lab where. Mm -hmm. And I hope we are talking about it proactively rather than after the fact. Because uh, our I think the, the, un, the story we're not talking about, it looks like this came out of a Chinese lab. And if it didn't, it could easily have done so. Our sort of global security around this is much less than like nuclear stuff. Uh, and there are bad people out there who would like to create uh, horrible diseases for us. And I, I think that's we're, we're, that's the story we, I, hopefully we, along with curing the, the, the bungling of our bureaucratic agencies, but that, uh, that's one I hope we are talking about before it happens. Mm -hmm. Neil, you get the last word. Well, I'm really hoping that we're not sitting here talking about the Omega variant with masks on six <laughs> foot apart, uh, having underestimated COVID's uh, ability to surprise us. But my sense is that, that that nightmare scenario of a more contagious vaccine evading uh, variant is it's a relatively low probability scenario. And I, I keep asking the experts about this. I suspect you would agree with that. No, I think a year from now, we, we won't be talking about COVID any more than we're talking about influenza it will have become endemic it will have become somewhat of a background uh, noise we'll be talking about the massive defeat the democrats have just suffered in the midterms and we'll be talking about whether that means that trump is going to be uh making a comeback uh and equaling grover cleveland's uh achievement uh, the 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 second non-consecutive term and when that issue comes up uh, I, I can assure you COVID is going to retreat rapidly uh, into the background because that will be the political story of the that century. spark in your eye is really scary when you say that. <laughs> you're, so, you're so looking be forward afraid. to talking about Be very Story afraid. to talk about Grover Cleveland. It's going to be, it's always a good moment. Well, it's, it, Grover <laughs> Cleveland shows that you can have non-consecutive terms. And I, I recently suggested to a, a, a member of the a Trump administration who was asking, what should I call my memoir? I said, it's obvious. You should call it the first Trump administration. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, on that happy, sad, whatever you want to return. But on that note, we're going to end this week's episode of Goodfellas. If you're not, we'll be back soon with a new topic, new conversation. On behalf of Hoover's Goodfellows, Neil Ferguson, H.R. McMaster, John Cochran. I guess we'll call him a Goodfellow this week. Our PhD <laughs> slash MD, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, all of us here at the Hoover Institution. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring H.R. McMaster, watch Battlegrounds, also available at hoover.org.